you. So thanks for coming to this uh, presentation. Uh, as Dinah said, I was here last November. I gave a talk already on pretty much all aspects I'm covering in my research. Uh, so what I want to do today is kind of pick on one of those aspects and expand it a bit more so you guys have a better uh, insight of what I'm doing with regards to uh, spatial dynamics of urchins and how that may eventually connect with farming potential of the green sea urchin in uh, Newfoundland. So I like to use uh, pictures and videos. Uh, we may have uh, trained eyes in this room, so maybe people from the benthic ecology lab or maybe from the psychology lab uh, can tell me what, uh, what's the main thing that you see on this video here. You may want to focus on the urchin and tell me where they are mostly located. I see them mostly in crevices, so that's a main thing that I'm going to discuss today. I think we tend to overlook the fact that these guys are mainly located in crevices. We don't really know what triggered that, so we've been doing a study to see how the wave action may affect this behavior, and as I said, I'll try to tie this back to uh, concepts of farming urchin, uh, potentially in uh, urchin barrens in eastern Newfoundland. Yeah, that's right. So that's uh, Desmeris severitis, which is a sulfuric acid producing uh, seaweed. We have a few kelp here. So I'll, I'll get back on those things uh, as I get into my talk. So that's a broad overview of my presentation. So I'll, I'll say a few words about my lab, my program. I did that in details last year, so I don't want to repeat myself too much here. Uh, then I'll get into the core of my presentation. So I'll focus on describing how urchin kelp dynamics work in eastern Canada. I'll say a few words about the feeding ecology of the green sea urchin in eastern Canada. And then I'll present the full details of a study we just uh, finished about the spatial dynamics of urchins depleted habitats. Then I'll sort of shift gears and talk a bit more about uh, concepts of urchin gonad production. So I'll, I'll talk about another study we did. So we fed urchins for nine months on different kelp diet. We looked at the gonad production. And then I'll finish with something I'm kind of working on right now with uh, two Norwegian companies. Uh, they developed a special feed to boost the production of uh, gonads in green sea urchins. So I'm trying to mesh all this together to come up with a study that could uh, match the ecology of the green sea urchin, whether we should feed them with natural kelp diets or if we should instead be feeding them with that special uh, formulated feed. So that's my presentation today. So a few words about my research. I'm with Memorial University of Newfoundland. That's in Newfoundland, Eastern Canada. So we have a map of Canada right here. So if you look at this big island here in the Northwestern Atlantic, that's Newfoundland. And so the ocean census center is a distinct unit as part of Memorial University, and that's the actual uh, ocean census center that you see here. So this unit is located right next to the ocean. It's about 10 kilometers from main campus. It's a great facility because we have lots of uh, opportunities within that building to uh, conduct various aspects of ocean-related uh, uh, research. Uh, these are two units that were added uh, more recently. Uh, this main building here was built in 1968 and they kept a building around it. So this uh, football shaped building here is where we do research on uh, species uh, with uh, a commercial interest. And we have this new facility right in the center right, uh, here which allows us to replicate the conditions we find in deep oceans. Uh, we can also work with aquatic invasive species uh, and we can work with pathogens as well. So we have a fairly uh, good facility out there that allows us again to touch on many aspects of the oceans. It's one of the largest marine labs in, uh, in Canada. Uh, we have 14 labs, so 14 faculties running research there, I'm one of them. Uh, we train uh, roughly 70 grad students come in our facility every year. Uh, we are an academic department since 2012, so we have our own master's and PhD program. My research, I'm running the Cold Ocean Benthic Ecology Lab, so uh, our long-term objective is to elucidate factors and processes that govern the stability and productivity of cold main benthic ecosystems, which I like to call CMBEs. Uh, to do that, we uh, investigate questions at different, biological, uh, at different levels of biological organization, starting with individual levels. So we are basically interested in knowing how environmental variability affects uh, behaviors, uh, aspects of growth, aspects of mortality well. So we do a lot of things in the lab. So we have uh, tanks in my lab with uh, flow through seawater. We can 
replicate or can play actually with light environments with temperature as well. And then we like to look at things at uh, the population and GG level. So for that, we dive a lot. So all my grad students dive for their research. Uh, and I also like to use uh, remote sensing and GIS to look at how things change over time at different spatial scales and temporal scales. We do all this under the general umbrella of, of uh, climate change. So a big theme in my lab is to look at how temperature and wave affect these uh, different uh, patterns at different scales. Uh, the main lab, natural lab, if I can use this expression, is uh, actually the coast of Newfoundland. So that's a cold water environment. As you can see, the coast is very uh, heterogeneous. Sorry. So there's lots of uh, little inlets and, and little bays and stuff. So the, the chemical composition and physical nature of the water is changing all along the coast. It provides for lots of gradients, which allow us to uh, examine a lot of questions. Uh, so I'm just uh, putting up this slide here to show you how the uh, temperature of the ocean changes annually in Nova Scotia, that's really close to Newfoundland, and also how the significant wave uh, height varies. And you can see that the temperature is having this annual cycle. So we have a peak in temperature, uh, usually in the middle of the summer, and then it goes down, and then in the winter, we're reaching the lows, so around zero degrees Celsius. So it's, it's repeating like that every year. Uh, for the significant wave height, the pattern is just kind of uh, out phase. So we have, when we have the highest temperature, we have the actual uh, lowest wave action because that's in summer, and then in winter, that's the opposite. So just to show you that things are uh, cycling a lot uh, according to a relatively uh, predictable pattern. Uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador, I don't have any significant wave height data to show you. Uh, but as you can imagine, it's a very exposed uh, habitat, so we have uh, very high significant wave height mo uh, throughout much of the year. For the temperature, pretty much the same, so we have this annual peak, which is uh, usually in uh, September, and then it goes down in uh, the winter. And one thin thing that you can notice is that uh, the uh, difference between the ups and downs are kind of diminishing in this part of the uh, year, and then it goes up. So there's lots of ups and downs uh, during the summer. And so I'm fo focusing on those ups and downs a bit uh, as part of my research, see how these things affect, or how these patterns affect uh, different species interactions. So a few words about Earth and Camp Dynamics in Eastern Canada. So our uh, kelp beds are a bit different than the ones we find in California. So we have uh, relatively prostrate kelp species out there. So we don't find kelp forests. We only have kelp beds. So none of these kelp reach the surface of the water. Uh, so we have two dominant species, Elaria stulanta, the one that's right here, which has kind of a midrib in the middle of the blade. Uh, that's the one we find as a dominant species in, uh, in Newfoundland. And Saccharina longicaris, which is much bigger, uh, tends to dominate in Nova Scotia. So different dominant species with different uh, tolerances to uh, temperature. So Elaria is a cold water species. Saccharina tolerates a bit more of that warm temperature, so it can survive at temperatures at around 15, where Elaria starts to degrade at temperatures about 10 or 11 degrees Celsius. Uh, what you see here is a picture of a, a transition between an urchin frond and a kelp bed right here. So uh, we find within the first few meters of water very dense stands of one of these two species, and that followed in deeper water by these fronds. So that picture was taken as part of my PhD in North Gulf of St. Lawrence. In this picture, you can find roughly 500 individuals per meter square. So we have three and four layers of urchins on top of each other that are just waiting to graze that kelp. And the rate of advance of those fronts over the kelp varies according to geographic location. Uh, in Nova Scotia, they have reported rate of advance of about uh, four to five meters a month. Uh, that's also happening in uh, North Gulf of St. Lawrence. In Newfoundland, we think it's a bit lower than that. Uh, not much studies have been done on that side in Newfoundland. So once the urchin front has advanced over the kelp, that's what we find in the wake of that front, so that's called an urchin barren. Uh, so we find in urchin barrens a lot of uh, sites of kelp, uh, not much blade left. Uh, there's no or virtually no uh, uh, fleshy seaweeds that can grow in this habitat. We find lots of uh, crustal coralline algae, as you see as the white patches here, but the rest is just rocks. And that state will just persist for as long as the urchin density can be kept at the minimum density. And so we have a cycle of alternation between the kelp bed and urchin uh, barren state, uh, which goes from anywhere from 10 years to uh, a 
couple of years, depending again on where you are in Eastern Canada. Uh, just rapidly here, that's uh, papers coming out of my PhD thesis. I was basically looking at scale protein interactions and looking at how these few uh, species could actually survive in ocean environments at such high density. That's Decimus tabernis, which produces sulfuric acid. That's Agarum clathrotome, which produces phenolics. So we think that these two compounds are uh, used by these seaweeds to repel uh, ocean. But the bottom feature, or the actual bottom line from these uh, studies is that green sea urchins are a, pers a persistent and permanent feature of rocky cephalotomies in eastern Canada. We don't have mass mortalities of urchin uh, in Newfoundland because water is too cold, but we do find those mass mortalities in Nova Scotia, so that changes the dynamic between these locations. Now, one of the first things I wanted to do when I joined uh, Memorial University was to kind of revisit this relationship or this uh, link between individual grazing and aggregated grazing in the front and look at how temperature may affect uh, the, this uh, relationship. So one of my master's students, Dessa, uh, published uh, one chapter of her thesis uh, in PLOS One, and that's the main hypothesis she was testing. So temperature is the poor predictor of scale bed destruction by green sea urchin. And that hypothesis was kind of going opposite to all basically what all the other studies were suggesting, which was that temperature was not uh, actually uh, affecting this relationship. According to most uh, studies, it was only the significant wave height or the wave action that was affecting uh, these relationships. So we used a combined approach to do that. So we had lab experiments. In one of them, we would just put urchins in these uh, containers here and just feed them with kelp at different uh, temperatures. And in another experiment, we had a wave tank, which was mimicking the back and forth motion of water in shallow coastal areas. So we kind of mimic a kelp uh, head and we put urchins there and we play with wave action and see how they would graze uh, these kelp and where they would actually locate themselves within the tank. And we uh, coupled that with field surveys. So in the field we went and we measured those rates of advance of urchin fronts over the kelp bed and tried to see how that was changing with uh, wave action. Uh, just a few results here. So this graph here shows on the x-axis temperature. That's the first experiment in the water bath. So we had uh, six uh, temperatures on the y-axis, the grazing rate, and we did that for two sizes of urchins, so small and large. We see that below 12 degrees, uh, there was no real change in the grazing rate of urchins, whether they were small or large. It's when we reach, uh, when went above 12 degrees that we saw a sharp decline, especially for the uh, large urchins, suggesting that urchins tend to graze less when it goes above 12 degrees Celsius. This graph here shows a grazing rate. Uh, grazing rate on the y-axis is a function of wave velocity from null to i. i uh, was a speed of 0.3 meter per second, which is pretty much what we find in ocean environments. And so we see that, as expected, the grazing rate was going down almost linearly as wave velocity was increasing. So no surprise on that side. What became interesting is when we start to look at where the urchins were uh, placing themselves within the uh, wave tank. So we put urchins into four different categories, those that were grazing on the actual kelp row, uh, those that were uh, located underneath the actual kelp, uh, those that were on the non-swept tiles, so that means on the bottom of the tank with nothing that could touch them, and those that were on the walls of the tank. So we use the urchins on the walls of the tank as an indication of their uh, propension to move, so more urchins on the tank on the walls would suggest that they were more able to move because they had to leave the flat surface and climb on those walls. And one thing that we see here is that as you increase wave action, there's more urchins that stay on the non-swept tiles. So they tend to just cling on the bottom to presumably avoid being dislodged. And there's less of them going on the walls. So that's a, an indication here that they don't really like to be uh, moved about by wave action. Uh, this uh, figure here, basically what the student did is she took uh, all the results from her laboratory experiments and she created some uh, equations based on temperature and urchin size and she basically tried to predict what should be the uh, grazing rate of urchin fronts in the field uh, based only on the temperature in the field. And she mapped the two sets of data and she came up with something pretty uh, interesting which is that the rates of in situ kelp loss were 87% similar to those predicted from the lab experiment. So basically, uh, the conclusion from that paper is that yes, it's possible to use two temperatures 
uh, and use it as a strong predictor of tail bed destruction by urchins. So that's kind of refuting other papers who said that no, it's only significant wave height or the, the wave environment that can affect these relationships. So if you are in an habitat where uh, wave action is sufficiently low, temperature can actually dictate those relationships. Now, as everybody in this room knows, our oceans are changing. So uh, the uh, change in uh, wave action, the change in temperature accelerates on a global scale. Um, and most studies so far uh, have been focusing on uh, examining the effect of extreme low or high ad adrenomic forces on various aspects of uh, benthic uh, consumers, looking at their distribution, abundance, and mortality. And most studies have focused on numerically dominant organisms, which makes sense because often these guys have the greatest impact on ecosystems. Uh, as, as far as it goes for mobile benthic consumers, if we look at their displacement, there's basically two things that can affect their displacement, waves and currents. I would argue that most studies so far have been uh, looking at observational studies of patterns, which is okay, but doesn't help us really to put the finger on what are the mechanisms exactly and what's in what proportion are they affecting that displacement. Uh, the other way to go is to use external testing. And so I think that there's more uh, observational studies available than there are external testing done. And if you can combine the two, that's even better. So uh, two demonstrations of wave-induced shifts in spatial dynamics limit accuracy of the prediction. So we, we should work a bit on that if you want to predict accurately what's happening in these ecosystems. So we use, again, the green surgeon as our model organism. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, there's uh, most studies so far looking at these relationships uh, again, our correlational field study. So looking at displacement, uh, looking at uh, uh, how the grazing fronts are formed, and looking at the rate of tail bed destruction. And most of these studies have uh, suggested that uh, these variables are all inversely related to significant wave height or current speed. But what about the causal links? It's possible if you just use correlational field studies that other factors could compound with significant wave height. So it's kind of hard to decipherate between these things. And most studies have focused on urchin fronts. Almost none of them have looked at what's happening in the barrens. So what's happening in the barrens is that urchins also do a few things. They will displace, they distribute, and they aggregate as well. So uh, we don't know what's the effect of the hydrodynamic environment on these uh, variables. So in Newfoundland and in Eastern Canada in general, uh, we can find uh, in high wave energy habitats, urchins that are uh, aggregating like this. So if the bottom is heterogeneous with cracks and crevices, they tend to actually go within these uh, crevices. If the bottom is flat, they tend to form uh, two-dimensional aggregations. So that's very different from the, the uh, three-dimensional aggregations they form in an urgent front. So they tend to form those clusters on flat surfaces. A uh, few studies have shown that displacement in barrens is random which suggests that the rate of encounters should increase with density, and in turn, uh, aggregation size should increase with density and with water flow. A study by Brady and Scheibling, that's the only one of its kind that's been kind of suggesting that, is that it's important to understand how urchins move within the barrens because uh, they came up with some data uh, suggesting that urchins move from deeper water toward shallower water and potentially could populate the urchin fronts when there's a perturbation within the environment. So keeping all these things in mind, uh, it is important to look uh, into more detail at uh, the displacement, microhabitat use, distribution, and aggregation of urchins in food depleted habitats, so in barrens. So uh, we didn't know a lot about the spatial dynamics of the green sea urchin in barrens, so the objective was to examine the effects of the wave environment in population density on the spatial dynamics of the green sea urchin. The approach we use is that we first uh, conducted two experiments in a wave tank. So that wave tank, again, is the same that we use in the previous study I covered already. So it's a wave tank that allows back and forth motion of water, so basically mimicking what's happening in shallow habitats where we find the green sea urchin. And we also uh, did a couple of uh, six-month surveys at two barren sites in Newfoundland. So basically what you see here is a mosaic of video footages, so we have one path here, another one, so we just, just stitched the image together to create this big mosaic. And uh, each little dot is actually an urchin. So Diver did that with the camera. We also monitored change in significant wave height with a water level logger. And 
also temperature luggers because we wanted to eventually link the patterns with uh, significant wave height and temperature. So in the two wave tank experiments, we measured displacement, microhabitat use, distribution, and aggregation. And in the field, we looked only at microhabitat use and distribution because of logistical uh, constraints which did not allow us to measure the two other parameters. And of course, our ultimate objective was to look at whether the two data set would talk to each other, if they would be consistent or not. So going with the first experiment, looking at displacement and microhabitat use, so we had urchins uh, that we put on the bottom of the tank. We have uh, 12 tiles here with hot concrete tiles mimicking uh, the surface of an urchin barren. Uh, and then we had uh, four wave velocities ranging from null to high. So in each trial, we had 48 urchins, which is equivalent to 44 individuals per meter square, which is roughly the density of urchins we find in barrens in eastern Canada. Uh, we had six microhabitats within that uh, tank. So I'm gonna go slowly through them. So flat surface, so that was the flat surface of each of these tiles with no object on it. Uh, protrusion, which was basically uh, bricks that we just uh, basically glued on the surface of those uh, tiles. We had depression, so simply carving the center of the uh, tiles. So we had a depression of about uh, one inch. Uh, lead, which is just like uh, plexiglass panels uh, put on an angle relative to the surface of the tile. We had crevice, which is, is just the spacing between adjacent tiles. And we had walls, as I said, used as an indication of the propension of urchins to just uh, move outside of the uh, tile area. Each trial lasted 45 minutes. Uh, we measured the linear displacement of marked urchins. As you can see here, there's five urchins that have taller on top of them. So these are the five urchins that we marked just to look and track changes in their displacement. Uh, we measured the proportion of urchins in each of those six microhabitats at the end of trials. And we discarded aggregated urchins. As you see here, some of them were actually getting together. So we just decided not to include them in the analysis because that could uh, bias the actual result because once these guys get together, they don't tend to move around to explore the rest of the, uh, of the habitat. Uh, each uh, treatment was repeated 10 times for a total sample size of 40, and we did that in winter when temperature of the water was about 4.5 degrees Celsius. So if you, uh, first graph here showing displacement on the x-axis, and uh, we have wave velocity on the x-axis from null to I. So again, no surprise on that side. We observed that displacement decreased more or less linearly with an increase in uh, wave velocity. So it's kind of supporting the results we found in the previous study. Uh, what was interesting is that the proportion of urchins in depression, lead, and protrusion did not vary with velocity. It was always about 20-25%. Uh, this uh, uh, graph here shows on the top panel proportion of urchins on flat microhabitat, so on the surface of the tiles and on the walls. And we see that both of them were decreasing uh, with an increase in wave velocity. So that means that urchins were abandoning the flat and wall, basically. So, and they instead converge on crevice. So crevice seemed to be a microhabitat that was uh, really preferred by the urchins because they were moving away from the flat and wall and not going to uh, these three microhabitats, but instead converging on crevice. The uh, second experiment about distribution and aggregation so uh, in this one, we crossed two factors, so wave velocity with four levels, density with three levels, so 12 treatments in total. What you see here is a picture of the uh, actual uh, external area. So we have nine tiles in this case, and all the tiles are having a flat surface because we don't want to mix the results with any other uh, spatial feature. Uh, so trials in this case were 90 minutes long. Uh, we measured aggregation size and type found basically there was two types of uh, aggregation. So those that we call unbounded, which are the uh, aggregations that form in the middle of the tank without touching the actual sides uh, or the walls. And those that were bounded, which actually originate from the uh, uh, merger of the, the tiles here in the bottom of the wall. We calculated the, an R ratio, which basically tells us, or give us an index of uh, about their distribution. So from zero, which is clump, to 2.15, which is regular. Uh, 10 replicates for each treatment, and we conducted that experiment in summer when uh, water was a bit uh, warmer than in the winter, so 12 degrees Celsius. 
So we found that uh, the distribution was clumped in 95% of the trials, suggesting that urchins have a natural tendency to get together whenever they can. Uh, there was no change in R at low density, so that panel here shows the R value on the y-axis and the wave velocity from null to I on the x-axis, and we saw no statistical difference between uh, these four wave velocities. But when you increase the density, so when you go intermediate and I, uh, that's when things start to change a bit. So we found a threshold of about 110 individuals per meter square, above which urchin would uh, start to cling even more together, to, s this, uh, to get together to form larger patches. Uh, the majority of the aggregations were bounded, so most urchins would start to form aggregations when they touch the size of the actual uh, tank. And aggregation size generally increased with velocity and density. So again, no surprise on that side. Now looking at the field data, so microhabitat use and distribution, our study site was Burden Tree Slope. There's a picture of that site here. So very nice site, very nice barrens. We have in the background here uh, some of those large boulders on which we conducted one of the two experiments I'm gonna talk about. Uh, that's that's most of the work right here. And you see all these urchins, which in this case are found pretty much everywhere, not only in crevices, and that's because on that day when I took the picture, it was pretty still. There was no uh, wave action really at that time. So we sample this barrens every week uh, for six months from May to October 2012. So we had 22 data points. We measured significant wave height, sea temperature. And what we did is that we kind of went at different locations on those boulders and found areas that were pretty much all similar in terms of the amount of flat surface and crevice. And we also put next to each of these plots uh, bricks just to mimic the habitat we had in the wave tank. So we had basically three microhabitats that we could look at in the natural setup. We look at the proportion of urchins in crevices, protrusions, and flat surfaces. And uh, then we also look at their distribution, again, by filming a permanent area of six by six meter. Again, repeated that uh, survey for uh, like weekly from May to October. That's just a close up view of the image showing that we had sufficient resolution to identify the urchins and also uh, put them in different bins, whether they were on flat surfaces or uh, in crevices. So we measured the R ratio and the urchin density. Uh, this graph here shows the temperature and the significant wave height throughout the survey. So we see the temperature kind of ramp up here. So it went up and peaked uh, somewhere in July to a value of about 16 degrees uh, Celsius. Uh, for the uh, wave environment, it was kind of mild, so it never went above 0.6 meter in terms of significant wave height. Uh, the temperature did not affect microhabitat use. I'm not gonna go through this entire table, but basically, if you take a look at it, uh, if you look at uh, any of these microhabitats, you will find the temperature did not emerge as a significant factor. Uh, the proportion on protrusions correlated with significant wave height. R was unrelated to significant wave height in both habitats. And that's what these data are telling us right now. And R was negatively correlated with temperature in crevices only. So overall, what this uh, study told us is that the percentage, uh, percentage of urchins in crevices was always around 80%, and that was four times higher than uh, on flat surfaces. So most of the time, urchins are in crevice. Uh, this distribution was clumped with an R less than one in both habitats on every sampling heaven urchins in crevices were more tightly aggregated than urchins on flat surfaces, and the density in both microhabitats did not vary with temperature or significant wave height. So these findings uh, were published uh, at some point this summer in NET, so if you want to have more details, maybe look, at, look up at this paper, but basically we kind of were able with that study to separate the relative effects of den urchin density and significant wave height, and that uh, gives us a good indication of how we could predict what state they will be in the barrens uh, as a function of significant wave height. Now I want to move in my uh, talk, uh, talking about uh, the uh, uh, green sphere chain as an untapped resource for Newfoundland and Labrador. So I'm gonna talk a bit about their gonads here. Uh, so harvesting versus farming. Uh, my definition of harvesting is just simply going somewhere, picking the urchins, opening it, take the gonads and send that to the market. Versus farming is take the urchins and do something with them to try to increase the gonad production. So I'm gonna use these terms as I'm going to my next slide. Uh, the green searching is an omnivore uh, with a strong preference for kelp. So 
for speeding. A grey bar in the distance is coming, as I kind of showed in my previous slide. The car vested for its gonad, also called Ro or Yoni. You see one of those gonads right there. Uh, in Newfoundland, the fishery is very small. It's limited to basically three bays on the eastern side of uh, Newfoundland, so bays of Trinity, Bona Vista, and Notre Dame. Uh, what people do, what divers do, is they target the front. So they just go in the front and they uh, pick them manually. And uh, there's a few harvesting criteria. So urchins need to be at least 50 millimeters in chest diameter. Uh, the gonad index must be more than 10%. And the gonads need to be of a uh, very uh, specific color, which is from yellow to orange. Uh, urchin row is a delicacy on the Asian seafood market. Uh, wild stock has been largely depleted. So as a result, fisheries have crashed many times. Uh, this has been uh, kind of reviewed by Johnson et al. in 2012. And so efforts have been uh, put forward to improve culturing techniques. So in terms of market quality, the color needs to be yellow to orange. The texture, we need to uh, have two different halves, as we see here. So we have the two halves of this gonad, so they need, they need to be pretty apparent. Uh, firmness need to be uh, pretty firm, and the taste need to be sweet. So several studies have investigated improving gonad production. So uh, studies that have used artificial diet, they got a, a GI that was pretty interesting. So most of the time, kind of way above 10%. Uh, the color was brighter, which is interesting again for uh, the market. But the downside was the taste. So most uh, studies using artificial diet found that the taste was a bit too bitter for what uh, consumers are looking for. For natural diets, we still get above 10%, but not as much as the artificial diet. Uh, the color is acceptable, but the taste is good. So it's kind of a trade-off between the two. So why would go with artificial diets? Because if you want to use natural kelp resources, that might be more costly. It takes time to collect those kelp in, in the natural habitat and just feed your things with that. It's a highly seasonal uh, pattern as well for the kelp. Uh, and then storage also of the kelp is also a limiting factor. So cost, if the cost of the kelp could be reduced, uh, that would open up maybe uh, an opportunity for uh, growing urchins on, on those kelp, in the spring coming at least. So the natural diets should not be overlooked in that context. So one of my students did uh, uh, a study that lasted about uh, nine months. So can kelp alone yield uh, sustainable GI? So we used the two dominant species of kelp in, uh, in uh, eastern Newfoundland, so Elia Sculenta and Lamina Digitata. We just wanted to see if they were suitable to have decent gonad production in the green creation. So our first hypothesis is that uh, Digitata produces highest gonad production than uh, Esculenta. Uh, second hypothesis, gonad production increases with feeding duration. So the more you feed your things with those uh, seaweeds, the better in terms of gonad production. Third hypothesis, uh, Laminaria and, and Elaria produce sweet tasting gonad, which again is one of the important criterion. Hypothesis four, Laminaria and Elaria produce marketable colored uh, gonads. So what we did is we went in Bay Bowl in June 2015, collected urchins at a depth of seven meter, and we collected them from the barren, and uh, we uh, used urchins with a chest diameter between 45 and 55 millimeters just to sort of standardize the size uh, up front. So what you see here is the, uh, what we did in the lab. So we brought these urchins in the lab, and uh, that's at the onset of the experiment. So we had uh, urchins in different tanks, which were fed with uh, our different kelp. So in one treatment, we had only laminar digitata, right here. In other tanks, we'd have only area sculenta. And in another tanks, we had uh, agarum catatum. And we knew that urchins would probably not do well on this diet. It was more of a procedural control that we used because this Again, this kelp is producing lots of phenolics, uh, which we know urchins have a hard time to uh, absorb. So we had 13 urchins, 30 urchins per tank. Uh, we used a randomized complete block design, so eight replicates for each treatment. We measured weight, weight and chest diameter. Uh, we also sampled urchins from a source population as a control, and we fed all the urchins in all the tanks uh, at libido. After 12 weeks, what we did is we switched. So this treatment here, we had to switch from Elaria esculenta to Laminina digitata because Elaria had disappeared from the system at that time, so that's kind of an annual species, so uh, the blade tend to disappear in September, so we switched for this guy here at that time, and the other uh, treatments remain unchanged. Uh, so at 12 weeks, we uh, took 
10 urchins for tanks. We sampled them for gonad index and for the, the color of the uh, gonads. And we take samples from control as well. And we calculate the gonad index just using standard uh, calculation for that. At the end of the experiments, after 34 weeks, uh, we have also measured the taste, uh, the texture, and we did that with a panel of, of people that were trained. Some of them were trained, or actually, some of them were already familiar with urgent and gonads, some were not, and so we had two groups with which we could work. And we also quantified the uh, gametogenesis in the sense of looking at the, gameto the gametogenic uh, stage. So where the urchins were in the uh, development process. Uh, and again, a sample from the control. And so what we found is that uh, the data produces the highest gonad index. So we can achieve gonad indices of 21 to 22% both 12 weeks and 34 weeks. All treatments produce higher gonad index uh, at 34 than 12 weeks, suggesting that you should keep feeding them for a bit more than 12 weeks if you want to see higher gonad indices. Uh, both seaweeds produce uh, sweet gonads, similar to source population. And uh, both seaweeds may produce marketable uh, colors as well. So the student is looking at the color right now to see if there's a change between these diets. But we think it's looking good for that. So can kelp alone yield a uh, suitable GI? The answer is yes, it can. Now can we do better with the specifically formulated feeds? And that's where the two Norwegian companies uh, come into play here. So Kasten and Nofima. Nofima is a company that uh, actually it's a, it's a scientific uh, corporation that actually one of their uh, specialties to uh, formulate feeds for the aquaculture industry. And Kasten is a marine-related investment company, so Kasten injected funds to support Nofima in the development of that special feed here. And so they came up with this uh, special feed, which contains uh, seaweed, corn, and wheat. 75% of it is seaweed, corn, and wheat. 11% is fish meat and fish oil. 14% is vitamins and minerals. Uh, they're telling me there's no hormones and no antibiotics, but they're telling me they found a special molecule that's supposed to boost the production of the, uh, of the gonads. So uh, that feed has been in production and used for more than 15 years. It's been tested in Norway, New Zealand, Australia, Western Canada. It's actually currently, right now, it's being tested in USA, uh, in California. Uh, it's been tested in Japan and commercially used in Norway and Japan as well for a while. So some of the advantages of that feed is that it's a dry feed that sinks, so it's never going up. So if you want to grow the urchins in cages, that feed's ne never going to go to the top. It's always going to stay at on the bottom of those cages. It's got a C shape, which means that this, along with the design of the cages, you won't lose your, your uh, pellets. So because they're a C shape, they won't escape through the cracks within, that, uh, within the crate. Uh, they dissolve into harmless particles after about seven days. What you see here are the crates that they are using to uh, grow the urchins. So there's a stack of 30 crates in this picture, I believe. So you can put these guys like virtually in the water uh, column and put uh, so many urchins in each of them and just introduce the feed within each of them as well. Uh, so uh, this is uh, some results that they got. So you have on the x-axis the number of weeks the urchins have been fed with that diet. And on the y-axis, you have the uh, gonad index. And you can see that within about 10 weeks, you can reach a fairly substantial gonad index of about 20%. So you just need tw 12 weeks to do it. So another study has been published with uh, Chris uh, Pierce from GSO in Canada. So this graph here shows at different temperatures the actual gonad index that they got. And we see that this bar here and this one and this one is for the special feed. So it always outperforms uh, the gonad production compared to the natural kelp diet that they use in their study. So most likely, can we do better with the specifically from the feed? Most likely, that's the answer. So the next step for me is to uh, do a proof of concept research project in Newfoundland with, uh, with Kasten and Nofima. So I'd like to test the suitability of Nofima to formulate feed for gonad production in the institution from Newfoundland. So I'm going to do in situ feeding experiments. So Kasten and Nofima will provide me with their protocols, provide me with a certain amount of feed, certain of uh, crates, uh, protocols. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to carry out two runs of 12-week feeds. So I'm going to deploy those crates, uh, probably in Babel, 
uh, collect 200 kilograms of virgins, which can be achieved in probably 20 minutes. It's like they're so abundant out there, it do doesn't take time to do that. Uh, feed urchins once a week for 12 weeks and assess gonadal nutrition quality and determine fecal matter production. And then report it. So, uh, and then I'd like to bring this a bit uh, further as well. So I'd like to eventually get here. So research the economical, ecological, and social impact of urchin farming in Newfoundland. Because that's a big deal right now. The urchin, uh, or the fishery in general in Newfoundland has collapsed big time over the last couple of decades. So people are looking for alternatives to uh, sustain the uh, fishery and aquaculture sector. So I think that's another uh, explored avenue here. So I'd like to uh, research those things with uh, these partners. So I'd just like to put that in perspective and just bring you back to what explained the results we got from the two experiments with uh, my master's student. So I showed that displacement is inversely related to wave velocity in the zero to 0.2 meter uh, per second range. We showed that as velocity increases, urchins move away from flat uh, surfaces, instead converging on crevices. Experiment two showed that distribution is slumped most of the time, 95% of the time, regardless of urchin density and wave velocity. There's a threshold urchin density above which urchins seek tighter contact with some specifics, and the majority of urchins in barrens use crevices instead of flat surfaces. They have a clump distribution most of the time, and they seem to form tighter aggregations in crevices and in flat surfaces. So I think that's very useful information that should be used to try to integrate that with possibly developing a, an urchin uh, harvesting industry in Newfoundland. So the idea would be to take the urchins and instead of growing them in urchin fronts where we find kelp, I think we should do that in the barrens, taking these things in, into consideration. So if we can bring urchins uh, sufficiently deep uh, where significant wave height would not induce those patterns, I think the, the only thing that would have to be done then is to feed them selectively with either that natural feed with kelp or with this uh, specifically formulated feed with, uh, with Mercuna. So that's kind of where I'm sitting with that. You say it's a work in progress. I just thought I would come today and just explain uh, what I'm at with in terms of those things. So I would welcome any comments if you guys have experience with uh, uh, this type of aquaculture with urchins or any other species that could be tied back to that, but I would appreciate any comments on that. So I think that's it. Uh, so I will take any questions. Thank you. at this point. I mean, they, they've released uh, only so much information to me. Like, I would need to sign a, whatever they call it, like a, yeah, exactly, yeah. So I, I'm at that stage, right? I, I'm going through that with my university. They say, don't sign it for now. So I'm, I'm not too sure what they're doing with that. It's kind of work in progress. I've been working on, like, it's been four or five months for me working on that right now. And I'm, I'm just progressing very slowly in this area, but they seem to be very confident in what they're doing. And it seems they've done a bunch of stuff in Japan and Norway, and they've been approved everywhere they've, they've gone with that diet. So they're using it big time in the field right now. It doesn't seem to be a problem.
funny thing with their diet is they're telling me you could, I mean, I showed like over the course of only 12 weeks, you can go from a gonad index of five to above 20. And they're telling me they can do that just about any time in the year. They could start it tomorrow, they could start it in January, and they would still get the same, same result, which is very surprising to me because, you know, urchin production is time over the year and stuff. So there's a lot of unknowns for me right now. I'm just like exploring the options with that. But again, they, they are very confident in what they're doing, apparently. Let's pass the test in Norway and Japan. Apparently. Good, good comments, thank you. Well, I mean, if you can't if you can take them directly at the source, as they are agile, and they are reproductive, I mean, that's to me it makes sense to do it this way because you don't have you, you have you can skip all the first phases which I mean it takes about two years to bring an urchin to maturity sexual maturity so I think if you do it this way if you go in the field I mean they're so abundant in the barrens in Newfoundland that if you can take them when you know they're already reproductive and it's only a matter of feeding them with something that's gonna help growing the gonads then you could save two years of investment much the same as soon as they reach a test diameter of about two centimeter that's when they are adults whatever the size they have after it's always going to be the same but there's a trade-off I think because uh, if you take very large urchins green sea urchins I mean they tend to produce large GI as well but the gonads are less firm they're more mushy like so it's less interesting for the market so they, they, they seem to prefer to work with urchins that are about four or five centimeter in test diameter don't tend to go larger than that. Yes. The control. Yeah, the control we use because urchins in the barrens are supposedly not feeding with anything because it's a barren, right? And so we got lower GI than those that were fed in, in the tank, but. We're not done going through the analysis of the taste uh, aspect, but uh, it seems that all the judges were kind of stepping back when they took the uh, gonads of, of, of the urchins that were fed with agarum, so because the gonad was looking kind of dark, very brown, so obviously it was no good for the urchins, but the two other diets, they did uh, almost equally as good. And there was no change from those urchins that came from from the field, but obviously you had fed on something else, not only kelp, because in the barrens you find fragments of kelp coming from the kelp beds, but you don't you don't find uh, those kelp naturally in the barrens. So that's another aspect I'd like to further investigate. Exactly, then that, that's why we had to uh, switch them in one of the treatments. Those that were fed Elaria, uh, Elaria tends to disappear. I mean, right now, like in September, October, it's, it's all gone. So we had to switch them to something else. No, we, we, we really picked the two kelp that we know could produce more gonads and urchins in Eastern Canada. There's not much species out there. Yeah. At Moss, if you take the example of those penguins that aggregate together to fight against, yes, yeah, so that's the same yeah. kind of, yeah, same kind of concept. I would imagine that urchins in the center of a patch are more protected. They're, they're less prone to be dislodged by wave action. So we think that they do that because they just want to avoid being dislodged by, by the uh, Earth.
I think they get an advantage in aggregating in crevices is that they can also braise their spines a bit more. Like, and yeah, because if, yeah, exactly. Because in those trials, if you went in the center of the tank and took a patch in the middle that was not touching the walls, you could easily, you know, kind of easily take the urchins off the bottom. And if you were targeting urchins that were bracing themselves against the, the actual uh, merger between the, the tiles and, and the walls, I mean, you would need a hammer to take them out. So they, they would really like use those right angles to brace more efficiently. And that's another indication that you probably do that just being avoided uh, dislodged, being dislodged by the wave action. It's a good question, but the answer is not, I think, easy to that. Like, there's different aspects you need to consider. You, I mean, if you go into collecting urchins, you create jobs, maybe. I mean, you could have people being hired to collect those scalp or grow them. And so it's it's a complex uh, analysis that I think should be done to determine whether we should go with a natural diet or with uh, the feed. Yeah. But the feed, I guess, is it's very, it's probably easy to produce. It can be done quickly. It's easily available. Whereas the kelp, it's kind of bringing back to this question where it's not always available in the environment. So when this happens, and I mean, my take with uh, the demand from the uh, uh, Asian market is that they want to have, they're going to have very fresh and they want to have them when they want to have them. So uh, it's not always possible to supply to that demand. So unless you have a, f a, a, a feed that's available readily, that's probably why they are trying to do that now. That they know they can do it quickly. I mean, 12 weeks, and you have what you need for the for the market, which doesn't seem to be the case with uh, with seaweed in the natural habitat. 